This is The Black Print, where being black is always the topic of conversation. The Black Print is brought to you by Rhymes and Designs and Good Evil Art. Welcome back to The Black Print. It's MJ. I hope you enjoyed our two episodes from last week. One celebrating National Poetry Month, our special episode released on Wednesday, and last Monday's episode on how not to perpetuate anti-blackness. A lot of the topics have been pretty heavy, and so I thought I would do an episode that was very important, quite significant, but maybe a little more lighthearted. So what I wanted to talk about today Because as I mentioned in last Monday's episode, black Americans have this thing about not traveling to Africa. I saw a statistic where it said around 2% of black Americans, African Americans, you know, whatever you're going to call us, only 2% of us actually travel to Africa. I thought the number was going to be low, but 2%? I don't know where they got those numbers from. I don't know where that statistic came from. But regardless of whether that number is accurate, the number should be a lot higher. So I wanted to talk about my trip to Africa, my trip to the motherland, and how that impacted me. And it did in such an amazing and beautiful way. And so I felt like I needed to share that with other people so people know, you know, what they're missing out on. It was the semester after my sophomore year in college. Our school was really big on its students getting international experience. And I decided to go to Ghana. I was like, I have this opportunity. You're paying for it. Of course, I'm going to go to the motherland. Africa was always on my list. And not like Africa as a country. I mean the continent. Africa as the continent has always been on my list of places to go. And after going to Ghana, spending six weeks in Ghana, I want to go back to Africa, like for real, and live there. You know, that's how amazing the experience was for me. That's the thing about Americans. I feel like we have this this idea about the United States of America where it's like it's the best place in the world. And I guess for some people, it is the best place in the world. But for black people, it's rarely ever the best place in the world. We're so afraid of losing something. We're so afraid of being uncomfortable. But we don't seem to recognize that we lose so much living in the United States. And we're not comfortable. We're not safe. We're not protected here. And there are some things that we wouldn't even experience in other parts of the world. So... You know, I applied and I got the acceptance and I was so excited. I was so excited. So I get on the plane. This is my first international trip. Oh my goodness, it was super long. I went to sleep and woke up multiple times. That's how long the plane flight was. But it was because it was an international flight, it was pretty cushy and they gave us food. So that was cool. But I got off the plane, right? And I'm looking around the airport. I step out of the airport and it looks like nothing I've ever seen before because this is my, you know, my first time traveling out of the country. And I looked around and it just looked so different. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that I was in Ghana. I couldn't believe that I had finally made it to Africa. I wanted to visit the continent my entire life. And I was finally here and I I looked around And something that stood out to me immediately was the airport was full of black people. It was nothing but black people at the airport. And I was like, that, that's different. So I get out of the airport. I'm traveling to our hotel. We did most of our program in Accra. And, you know, I get some money. I get some Ghanaian money and... It has black people on it. You know, it, the money has black people on it. That was so incredibly powerful to me. In that moment, looking at the money and seeing black people on it, 
that was the first time in my life where I felt like I really belonged in my environment. Like I didn't stand out, like I didn't like I wasn't different. When I looked at the money and I looked around, I felt like this was what it was supposed to be. People are supposed to grow up in a society, in a community, in a world for them where they're not an exception to the rule. I felt so comfortable. It's such a burden on our psyche to try to meet standards, to try to see ourselves in other groups of people because that is, you know, the landscape, that's the demographic of the country that you're born in. And then, you know, I'm walking and I see black people on the billboards. I see black people in the advertisements, the commercials. I see black people, you know, you go to the grocery store and if there's people on the food, unless the food is imported, there's black people on the food. And I just had, of course, never experienced such a thing, but it felt so right. It felt like what life was supposed to be like. And the people of Ghana, they were so kind and nice and they were so helpful to us they wanted us to have a great time and experience their country and they were so willing to share their culture with us like multiple times we're traveling here there and you know some of the the locals they would stop and try to help us with the local language they would you know give us phrases once we started shopping in in Ghana in Accra and you know we were wearing the clothes they would see our outfits and they would be like oh you know that's a nice dress they'll be like especially when they found out that we were oh as the black people that went to Ghana that we weren't from Ghana they were like oh I love your hair I love your dress like they felt like we were embracing our own culture and that made them so happy and made them so proud um, I had several people while I was in Ghana and they were like, no, your people are my people. Like, I'm looking at you and like, it's undeniable we're family. <laughs> and it was true. It was so true. I got there and I looked around and I was like, that person looks like my great aunt. That person looks like my cousin. That is where my people come from. That's where so many black people come from. It's crazy growing up in the United States and thinking about the period of time when we were enslaved and how they they tried to strip everything from us. They tried to strip our roots, our culture, you know, our heritage, our language. They tried to strip all of those things from us. And then you kind of, you know, you look at these people and they have these family trees and you don't have that. And you feel like, You're disconnected. You're disconnected from your past. You're disconnected from your ancestors. And when you feel that way, sometimes it feels like you're disconnected from the world. You're disconnected from your present and from your future. And, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know where my people came from. I knew I was of African descent. And I was very proud of that. But being able to pinpoint an area in Africa, pinpoint a country, it made me feel real it made me feel legitimate it was such an amazing experience and like you go to different parts of the world and the culture there is so different say you're walking down the street in Accra and you don't know where you're going there's somebody on the street you know you stop and you ask them for help and they could be going a completely different direction and they will walk you to your destination or get you very close to your destination just out of the kindness of their heart They don't want anything. They're not trying to get money out of you. They're not trying to hit on you. They're not trying anything. They just want to help you get to where you're going. I feel like that's their satisfaction from the situation. Like I was able to do something. I had the ability to do something to help somebody. And I did. And the food, I'm a very picky eater, but... Unless we were on the road, because we traveled around Ghana a lot, and we even traveled to Togo, which was also amazing. We, um, When we went to Togo, we climbed a mountain and lived at the top of the mountain in um, a little village. They lived in mud huts, which were impeccable, by the way. 
I was walking around in the hut I was staying in with my socks on, with white socks on. There was nothing on the bottom of my socks. Um, so welcoming, so kind. And then food is food is a labor of love. You know what I'm saying? So you make these dishes, these wonderful stews. I love stews. So, I mean, I was so well fed in Ghana. You would think I would have gained like 15 pounds but we walked so much as well so like it was a lot of good healthy weight you know what I'm saying but it's like when the people in Ghana when the the family because we went to go stay with a family for 10 days and when they cook they would cook so much and they would want you to get a second helping or a third helping like if you're not getting a second helping then it's like are you dieting what's going on eat 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 get sleep eat be happy be healthy that is the feeling I got from living in Ghana for six weeks also I mean of course in case people don't know you know in case you've only seen parts of Africa from these infomercials or from movies of course the landscape of Africa is beautiful there's so many beautiful sights to see and of course that includes Ghana I had so many amazing experiences like we went to the botanical gardens and it was so serene it was therapeutic you know what I'm saying and then we went to the memorial park for Kwame Nkrumah gorgeous just amazing we were driving and we saw a sign for a waterfall and we're like um okay let's do it so we got out the car and we walked and we walked and we walked and then we got to this clearing and it was this gorgeous waterfall you saw people laughing and splashing you know it was a real legit waterfall it was really beautiful the water had even created a slide in the stone and people were sliding down it was amazing and then there's this suspended bridge that is above some of the treetops they said it's strong enough for two elephants to walk on and we walked across that and one of the hardest parts was when we went to visit the forts where our enslaved ancestors were held captive i think because slavery was so long ago A lot of people don't really have an understanding of how horrific it was. Going to those forts, as they called them, was extremely emotional for me. You go in there, and there, of course, there aren't people in there anymore. There haven't been people there for a long time, but it's almost unimaginable that people were held there after they were abducted. The people were held there in chains in those conditions, and they told us stories, horror stories, stories. You know, you saw things that you can never unsee. They told us stories that you can never forget. We as a people can't forget what was done to us. What was amazing about living in Ghana was that It was amazing how quickly it felt like home to me. We walked around Accra a lot. We walked from the hotel. We walked from the home of our exchange family. And so I started to get familiar with my part of the city. And I just felt so at home. I felt so at home after a week and a half. Um, I felt extremely comfortable. I just felt a part of the city. In Ghana, they have a form of transportation called trotros and they're they're like vans or mini buses and because everyone's going to the same location your fare is greatly discounted so it's just like a couple of cents and so the trotros are packed you know we caught a trotro and we were shoulder to shoulder with people for 45 minutes to an hour and it was hot and we were just listening to the radio and it was so it was so pleasant to me, and I was nodding off in the trotro. But when I was awake on the trotro, the local people, they were 
again, assisting us with the language and giving us phrases that we could use so that we could get the best deals while we were there. I went to a salon and it, you know, everyone was sitting around and they were talking and it was just cool, you know? It was cool. Like, I didn't feel like an outsider. They didn't make, at least me, you know, I don't know how the, the non black people experience our stay there, but I was so comfortable. Another thing I loved about Ghana was the open air markets. The biggest open air markets you've ever seen, and they had everything. Everything you could think of. You're looking for shea butter, you're looking for soap, you're looking for fabrics, you're looking for, you know, jewelry, you're looking for woodwork, you look for metalwork. Anything, anything you could think of, it was teeming with people. It was so active and it was so vibrant. Very courteous, even though like it's jam packed. I love the markets. I especially love the market in Kamasi. Kamasi is a very beautiful city. It's very green, it's very plush. But the markets, if you, when you visit Africa, especially if you're going to a place like Ghana, because that's the country I know the most about, you have to hit the markets up. It's an unforgettable experience. The first time I ever saw the ocean was in Ghana, and I just felt like that was special, symbolic of something, you know? But there was this uh, resort that we went to. I, I forget where it was. And our accommodations was individual huts. You know, it was super cool. And they had like walkways above the ground. It was really beautiful. And the food there was amazing. And they brought so much out. But we went to the beach because it was right on the beach at nighttime. And the sky was, it was dark. It was black because, you know, it wasn't a lot of lights. And the sky was clear. And so you could see the stars. And laying on the beach, it just felt like, the sky was bigger. It felt like the world was bigger. And it was such an amazing, beautiful experience laying on the beach in Ghana under the stars. It was so romantic. It really was. It was very romantic. There was also this, you know, when you travel with non-black people, I feel like they kind of throw caution to the wind. Like we went to, um, Mole National Park, which is a reserve, and we were standing at the watering hole, and like an, an elephant walked up, which was like, wow, an elephant! It was, of course, it was really exciting, but we were standing by the watering hole, and these, I can't remember whether they're crocodiles or alligators, but it was like two, two of them sitting right by the edge of the water, you know, watching us. Well, they were my classmates, and they act like they don't even see these alligators, crocodiles, whatever they were, that close to us. But when the elephant walked up, that was really awesome. Another amazing moment that we had was when we went to visit a stilt village. So we, we got in boats, and we traveled across the lake. We rode boats across the lake for I don't even know how long it was. It was kind of a long boat ride, actually. And there was a village built on stilts. So it was a little village elevated above water. And that was, you know, that was how they lived. Another thing that I really appreciated about Ghana was a lot of people, the things that made people happy was simple things. Like being with your family, being with your friends, eating good food, having a drink, you know, listening to good music. There were a lot of people there that didn't have a whole lot in terms of, you know, material things. But that didn't seem to keep them from their happiness. A lot of people, despite how an American might view their their living situation, they're very happy. I think we put too much importance in things that aren't that important. And then that, that breeds dissatisfaction, that breeds unhappiness. We went to a school, a school in Accra. And that's one of the things that was so cute about Ghana. It was like all the kids, they, you know, they walked around in their uniforms. The little girls had very short hair, and um, but they wore earrings. 
and they're just so beautiful, so cute. But we went to the school and the children, they were so confident. They were so spirited, you know. They got up in front of us and they performed songs and poems. Um, they did dance numbers, you know what I'm saying? They would get up, they were willing to get up there and do their lessons in front of us. It seemed like they were so empowered in their education and in their skin. And I think that's definitely something that we've lost here. That's something we're missing. And the, the children, they were so, education was so important to them. So that was an extremely beautiful experience. But I just love their spirit. We did so many things because we were there for six weeks and we were we went with a, a traveler, you know, so she just wanted to see and do everything. And I think she had been to Ghana multiple times, but she was still gung-ho about seeing all the sights, um, which was great. It was really great. I mean, it was exhausting at some points and I actually got extremely sick, but I didn't care because I was like, I'm here. I need to see this. I need to experience this. But we went to a traditional religious ceremony and... One of the most amazing things to me about visiting Ghana, about living in Ghana for six weeks, was the fact that I saw so many similarities with Ghanaians and American black people. These people took so many steps to try to detach us from who we, who we are, what we are, where we come from. But still, despite all of that, through all of that, we maintained so much from our cultural beginnings. And um, those moments made me feel the most connected to my past. We are still who we've been. And I think if we realize that, if we recognize that, we're only going to get closer to that feeling, to those sentiments and once we come to that recognition, things can only get better for us. So that was my recollection of my trip to Ghana and Togo. I was only in Togo for a couple of days. I hope that this talk has encouraged you to at least explore the possibility of traveling to one of the many beautiful countries in Africa. I'm going to end this segment with a song from S.U. the Guru called Rock No Limit. But you really doubt me Son of the sun, gotta be shining You really doubt me Come for them kings and queens Ask about me Never been stopped before Can't stop me. Can't You stop. really doubt me 504 with them diamonds But you really doubt me Son of the sun, gotta be shining You really doubt me Come for them kings and queens Ask about me, never been stopped before. You really doubt me? What did you say? You hate is this plan? You never gon' stop the bling. Go hard like a rocket, you know we gon' rock it. This good evil art, no dream. Wake up in hell and make this shit heaven. You know this an everyday thing. Been beat up and killed like king, but still living on the way. Really, bro, your genius level is my free throw. This core processor built pyramids in Cairo. Standing up for eyes, ain't trying to be no hero. More like Hyro, glyphic spit and pyro. Oof, ah, dragon raps, ah, banging on show, nuff. Buck the other side I tuck my chain for slow bucks Cause it's a marathon But underneath my teeth Please believe I'm gon' shine 504 with them diamonds But you really doubt me Son of the sun, gotta be shining You really doubt me Come for them kings and queens Ask about me Never been stopped 
over four. Can't stop. You really doubt me? Yeah. Five over four with them diamonds. But you really doubt me? Can't stop. Sun of the sun gotta be shining. You really doubt me? Can't stop. Come from them kings and queens. Yeah. Ask them about me. Never been stopped before. Stop. You really doubt me? Doubt me. So that was Rock No Limit by SU The Guru. Please remember to like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions or suggestions, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section. That was The Black Print, and this is MJ, sending you love, peace, and ammunition. <laughs>